Rise of Totalitarian Islam, Lecture 2. Good morning, everybody. Yesterday, we talked about uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, just to review very quickly. Um, Hassan al-Banna founded Muslim Brotherhood in 1928, um, grew the organization to a peak in 1949 of 500,000 members, 2,000 branches throughout Egypt, I think capitalizing to a large extent on uh, the frustration within Egypt with um, colonialism, with uh, the nihilism and the hedonism prevalent uh, in the culture, and of course in the poverty and, and the fact that Egypt was going nowhere. It was, it was stuck. There was nothing happening. Uh, with the, uh, as we said, uh, Bana was assassinated in 1949 by the Egyptian government because he was attaining such power, because he was becoming such a threat to the central government. 1952, the officers' revolution, uh, Arab nationalism comes to the forefront, uh, Nasser takes over, uh, and very quickly, in spite of the fact that Muslim brotherhoods were allies of his and in the revolution itself, tries to eliminate them by arresting thousands of them, uh, hanging, I think, six members, uh, sending the rest of them uh, to jail. And as we said last time, many people looking at the phenomena at the time. Uh, and, and you have to remember the attitude at the time was also nationalism and socialism are going to work. That was the attitude of most academics studying this. Uh, uh, this Great experiment in the Arab world, this is going to change the Middle East. This is, this is the wave of the future. Uh, Islam, as people in the 60s believed generally about, I think, religion. Islam is dead. Religion is dead. We are in uh, this age of, you know, socialism, communism. You know, communism was growing. Religion was seen as a, as a if, if you go back and... We kind of historians, I think, of the period. Religion was finished. It, 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 was, it was over with. There was no religious movement. I think they're, they're still trying to absorb the idea that religion is a growing force in America and in other places of the world today. But certainly in the 60s and 70s, nobody wanted to talk or write about religion. And yet there was this certainly this undercurrent in the, in the Muslim world. Uh, Islam was still a powerful force. I want to review quickly what it is that the Muslim Brotherhood at this point 1954, 56, what do they stand for? Because what happens later, what happens with Said Qutb and, and, and others, is just building on this foundation. The foundation of these ideas is a constant all the way to today's Bin Laden. So what are the ideas that motivated the Muslim brother? And let's start with the way they look at history, the way they look at their own history, at Islamic history. In their view, again, they ask the question that Muslims have been asking since the, maybe the 17th, 18th century, what happened? Why are we in decline? Why are we losing out to the West? And their conclusion is that, look, the decline really started quite, uh, you know, almost immediately after Muhammad died. The only truly Islamic culture that have ever existed in their mind was the period from when Muhammad starts his, um, you know, starts getting revelations from God to the death of the fourth caliph, the fourth leader following Muhammad. That's it. That was the period, and they call it the righteous fourth, four caliphs. You know, that is, that is the period of Islamic greatness. And, they, and from there, there's a deterioration. Even though politically, militarily, they are successful, they would argue underlying that success, behind that success, there's a rot. There's a corruption right under the surface that is ultimately going to lead to the destruction of, uh, of, uh, of Islam and of the Caliphate. Indeed, what we view as the height of Islamic civilization, uh, anywhere from, the, from uh, 700 to 1200, when they're translating the Greeks, when they're building libraries, when they're you know, they've, they've achieved empire status in terms of militarily conquering more than half of the known world at the time, they view as the complete corruption of Islam. To them, Islam is being corrupted by Greek ideas. 
Islam was corrupted by reason. You know, back to Al-Ghazali. Reason is out. You know, now they would never call it reason. They would say pagan ideas from the Greeks and, and so on. But they would never, they would never, because they claim to be, you know, they use the word reason. And they claim to be that, that there's no conflict and so on. But what they're really talking about is the corruption of reason from their perspective, corruption of Greece, and that is where Islam starts the real decline. Uh, so it's philosophy and its influence on Islam which destroyed Islam. And indeed in this setting, they view the first big catastrophes for Islam. The Crusades, the Christian Crusades, the uh, Mongol invasions, and then Europe's push of Islam out of Spain, then Europe's push of Islam out of Eastern Europe, the Balkans, Greece, and ultimately the complete capitulation in World War I, where the Ottoman Empire is completely overrun by the colonial powers, primarily the French and the British. To them, the Ottomans' success early on is a result of the fact that early on the Ottomans were relatively pious and then got corrupted again by Western ideas and fell apart. So it's all about the more rigid, the more consistent you are as a follower of Islam, the more successful you're going to be. The more successful you're going to be. So by the end of World War I, the enemies of Islam had basically wrecked the Islamic State, had ensured its impotence, had imported in a massive way Western values and Western ideas, this idea of cultural imperialism. And then by supporting Zionism, by putting in a state of Israel, you know, that was just, that was just horrific from their perspective. Here was a here is this implantation of a Western civilization in the heart of a Muslim area, in the heart of the Middle East. Uh, it's not even that the Jews, it's the fact that they're not Muslims. This to them, and they, and, and they really view this, this is the Crusades again. If you remember, the Crusades are about these Christians coming and taking over what is today Israel and going to Jerusalem. This is just another form of the Crusade that... The Europeans sent these Jews over to take away a piece of Islam as part of this imperialistic, as part of this ongoing war between Islam and the West. And so Israel to them is a symbol, more than anything else, it is a symbol of their own decline and of this crusaders, this, these infidels coming in uh, and, and taking over from them. Relationship with the, uh, with the rest of the Islamic establishment, they believe that most of the official imams, the official, you know, there are no priests really in Islam, but the, the official preachers in the mosques, the official schools, uh, they were all being co-opted by, uh, by money and power and the political regimes. So they were not to be trusted, they were to be thrown out, and indeed, it was Al-Azhar in Egypt, this university, this scholarly place where Islam was studied, was responsible in their view for allowing the corruption of Egypt. The, the, the scholars of Al-Azhar never stood up and said no to the Westerners, no to these secular ideas, no to nationalism, no to socialism. They let it happen, and they bear the moral responsibility for what happened. So the enemy is the, the existing religious establishment, or one enemy. They place a big emphasis on this idea of unity. The Muslim world needs to be unified. It needs to have one set of ideas. They need to all speak with one voice. Disunity is a, is a sin. Muslims are supposed to come together, you know, as if there's one consciousness driving them. It's why they advocate for one ruler, because, and they, they're very much against political parties, because that is, emphasizes this disunity. The Muslims are all supposed to share one goal, think alike, have the same basic values, speak with one voice. And, uh, for example, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, 
who are Sunnis, and we'll talk more about Sunnis versus Shiites, uh, have no animosity, or there's nothing in their writings that's anti-Shiite. They indeed view, they, they want to see the Sunnis and Shiites coming to unite against all these challenges, against all these fronts. And we'll talk, we'll talk about where the splits later occur with the Shiites, and, and even what's going on today. You know, to what extent is, uh, uh, is Bin Laden anti-Shiite versus Zakawi in Iraq? And, and I think there was a split there between them in terms of their attitude to Shiites, to a large extent because of Iranian support. Uh, you know, Iranian, the Iranians, I think, are supporting Bin Laden uh, and have been for a long time. Um, so they were against political parties. Um, one thing uh, where you can see a, a, a direct Western influence um, of socialism and indeed communism and the, and the language of communism, we'll keep seeing this, uh, because this is, this is a feature of, of the Iranian Revolution, is that the Muslim Brotherhood and, and many of these Islamic groups pick up the concept of social justice. They become big advocates of social justice in those terms, in the terms of the left. And social justice, of course, to them means a more equal redistribution of wealth. You know, uh, 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 you know, resentment towards the gap between the rich and the poor. A resentment, of course, that under totalitarian regimes, there's some basis for, because, of course, the rich are rich because they're corrupt, uh, not because they've earned it. But they don't see, of course, that distinction. And their criticism of capitalism is this difference between the rich and the poor, this gap in wealth. And they speak a lot in the terminology of social justice. Um, to them, democracy uh, is a corruption. Why would democracy be a corruption? Because it places the will of the people above the will of God. It is the people who now are responsible for legislation. It is the people who are sovereign. Whereas, according to Islam, only God is sovereign. And his laws are already written. You don't need a vote to figure out what the laws are going to be. The laws are in the Quran. They're in the traditions. They're in Islam already. You don't need the sanction of the people in order to prove God's laws. I mean, they're done. We're finished. There is no role for, e even for legislature. There's nothing to legislate. It's all being done. Now, you know, you can tinker with it. You can, there's certainly uh, aspects of modern society that need new laws based on the Quran. So you need some legislature. But the, basically the laws are there. They're done. You know, all you need now to make sure, you know, in the future if there is legislature, you just need to make sure that everything they do pass is consistent with those laws. But for them, the Quran is their constitution. It is their constitution. And they have, you know, one ruler... With a constitution, they don't view it as, um, as a dictator, as, uh, as a totalitarian, because we're all Muslim. We want to live under these laws. No. This is not forced on us. This is just our will expressing itself. Yeah. As we said, the ultimate is the imposition of uh, Islamic law, viewing the Quran as, as a constitution, uh, you know, 500 verses in the Quran, I think out of 2,000, deal with legislation, deal with crimes, punishments, how to deal with different issues relating to laws. So to them, there's some legitimacy in viewing it as a form of, of uh, basic law. Uh, Muslim brothers don't spend a lot of time on how a Muslim state will be structured ultimately. Uh, we'll, we'll see that Khomeini, on the other hand, spends a lot of time on that. And it becomes a big deal because they, of course, gain political power, so they have to structure an Islamic state. Uh, but generally, Quran is the constitution. We need one person who is going to rule. That person should be kind of elected uh, through consultation with the elders of the community. The f smart people in the community are going to choose this person. Once he's, he's elected... He's there for life. And he needs to be elected based on the fact that he's going to be virtuous. He's going to be a good Muslim. He knows the Quran. He's knowledgeable. He doesn't have to be, according to the Muslim Brotherhood, he does not have to be a religious scholar. 
Again, a difference, as we'll see with Iran, where it does need to be a religious scholar. He doesn't have to be a religious scholar, he just has to know the Quran, and then the religious scholars will be his advisors. They will advise him on how to rule. He has to be virtuous, pious, and most important to them, as we talked last time, there's no separation of church and state. Bana, you can actually is quoted as saying, quote, Caesar, and what belongs to Caesar, is for God Almighty alone. So again, direct, uh, direct uh, relating to the comment, you know, the, the Christian saying about, about what is for Caesar, leave for Caesar, and what's God's God's. To quote Bana again, there is no authority in Islam except the authority of the state which protects the teaching of Islam and guides the nation to the fruits of both religion and the world. Islam does not recognize the conflict which occurred in Europe between the spiritual and the temporal powers between church and the state. Okay. Now, they talk about freedom a lot. Um, what do they mean by freedom? Well, in one sense, freedom means to them not being under Western rule. So it means independence in some sense, uh, uh, you know, having an independent state. So freedom is never, from their perspective, as we understand it, freedom of the individual from coercion. It has nothing to do with the individual. It has to do with the Islamic nation. Freedom, when they talk about freedom, they're talking about freedom from infidels, from the West. Freedom to do, to impose Islam on everybody in that Islamic state. Freedom of religion for them, for example, means, they, yeah, everybody has a right to decide what religion they have, absolutely. And then we have a right to decide what to do with them. Right? <laughs> if they're Muslims, they're first class citizens. If they happen to be Christians or Jews, they're second class citizens. If they're atheists or pagan or, or something else, then they're third class citizens or, or maybe just dead. But you can choose. In front of God, you have, the Quran says, there's no compulsion in religion. <laughs> and then it tells you what to do with the people who decide otherwise. Okay. Freedom of expression is the same thing. Everybody can say whatever they want, according to Albana. You can, you can publish what you want and so on, as long as it's consistent with Islam. So he actually talks about the existence of freedom of expression. But you can't offend Islam. We discovered that with the cartoons, right? And, and the Muslim publishers who published elements of the cartoons, sometimes even crossed out, are all in jail today. There was a publisher in Jordan who published them just to show the Muslim world what was going on in Denmark and how horrible it was. I mean, he was anti. And he actually crossed out elements within the cartoons. He still landed up in jail, uh, as did uh, many others or, or had to go into hiding. So I think the important thing here to get is that Islam is all-encompassing. It covers everything that you do. There are rules about every type of behavior that you have. And this is what needs to be imposed. Um, let me just mention um, their attitude towards, uh, towards property. Again, they have, this, uh, they have this mixture. On the one hand, they believe in private property. On the other hand, they say, well, yeah, you can have private property as long as it's good for society uh, and as long as God is okay with it. Um, ultimately to them, all wealth, all property, all our lives, everything belongs to God. And then it's just a question of how you interpret what God's intentions are and who gets to make those interpretations. So there are no individuals, and therefore there is no private property. Uh, of course, uh, in the economic realm, they're very, very, very anti-usury. You know, if you think that Christians were anti-usury, they're much more adamant about this. Uh, so they have their own Islamic banks. We, they don't pay interest, and they don't charge interest, and they find ways around it. You know, you, you, you're buying shares, you're getting dividends, but... Uh, there, there, there are a lot of these banks in the Gulf Coast, in the Gulf states today, uh, even in Egypt, there's some very large Islamic banks, uh, and all across uh, the Middle East, and even, uh, actually not just in the Middle East, if you go to Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, there are a lot of these Islamic banks that practice Islamic 
economics without, without interest. You know. um, it is a duty to pay a tax to help the poor. It's one of the four pillars of Islam. So again, this, social, this notion of social justice uh, in modern terms. And then the last thing um, in terms of the ideas uh, that I want to just mention is their attitude towards women. Um, and and the, again, there's, there's, there's a little difference here between the way the Muslim Brotherhood view it and then the way it develops later on. You know, they would be the first to say men and women are equal, except the fact that they're different. Men are generally smarter and more emotionally stable than women. And therefore, they have a different role in society. Um, and therefore, they, you know, women need to be protected in some way. But this is for their own good. It's not, you know, other than that, they're equal. They're the same. Um, we just have to be realistic, and we have to take into account the mental and emotional differences between the sexes. We also have to take into account the fact that, at least when it comes to sex, men are incredibly weak, and therefore can be, can be thrown into a, you know, can be uh, distracted, if you will, by an elbow, or a knee, <laughs> or even just a face. Right? So we just have to take our nature into account and develop laws around that. Ultimately, women exist from God's perspective to reproduce for the purpose of reproduction. That's why their place is in the home, their place is to educate the kids. Now, they can go out and, and get, a, get a, uh, an education and, and earn a living and, and get a job, that's fine, but that's always going to be secondary to the primary responsibility of staying in the home and taking care of the kids. If they can manage both, okay. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood would not insist on, the, on what we've seen on television, you know, the Taliban type, all black, everything. They, they have uh, looser rules, you know, elbows, knees have to be covered, uh, some kind of head covering, but it doesn't have to be the whole face. So they're, they're clearly more influenced by the contemporary, you know, Egyptian culture of the time, uh, which was much more modern. Uh, and you have to, because, because of men's attitude that's so oriented towards sex, you have to control the interaction between the sexes. So you never leave a, a woman and a man together alone. Because, you know, what will happen? Um, <laughs> men are animals, ultimately. <laughs> but they're also smarter and more mentally stable somehow. So um, you certainly, a married woman would never be, you know, unless her husband was there to, to protect her. Uh, in, you know, of, of having exposure to, to a male who wasn't part of the family. Um, so, uh, you know, there's no rules here like in Saudi Arabia today where women can't drive and women can't work. Uh, there's certainly none of that. But there is this clear distinction of the role of women, uh, where they need to be most of the time, and what they need to be protected from. Uh, and, and in all these cases, they need to be protected from men from sex. That's what they need to be protected from. Um, according to Islam, according to Muhammad, uh, men are allowed four wives, which in those days was a huge step forward because before that they could have as many as they wanted. So uh, the women's rights movement in, this, in 600 was, was really happy with just four. Um, Islam also says that the male has to treat them all fairly and equally which modern Muslims would say, modern uh, Islamists would say, since that is impossible, it boils down to you can only have one wife. You know, and that's how they justify monogamy in many of these Muslim countries, basically by the practicality of it. Four wives is just, you can't treat them all the same, which is what the Quran says you have to do. And therefore, one is just kind of the default. Uh, but they are, in every Muslim country, um, that's ruled by, by some form of, of, uh, of Islamic law, you can still have uh, four wives. It, there's a question of whether the first wife has to prove the other wives or not, and that varies from country uh, to country. Indeed, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood would claim that monogamy in the West uh, is the cause of unhappy marriages. 
and is the cause of the high divorce rate. Uh, and, uh, that, you know, it's, uh, and it's why men in the West seek prost prostitutes. And all you have to do is just allow for four wives, and, and you get a happy, blissful marriage. I don't know where they live, but... Um, so you get a sense of kind of the medieval nature uh, of these ideas. Uh, the, uh, they want to go back, literally go back, to 600, 700, when the four caliphs ruled, uh, where these were the attitudes uh, towards women, uh, where these were the attitudes towards politics, uh, these were the attitudes towards religion. Religion is the primary. God is the primary. Uh, there is no sense of, uh, indiv of the individual, uh, of the, the value of the individual's life other than as a servant to God. No. Remember, Islam means, I don't think I mentioned this, but Islam means submission. That's what the word means. And it means submission to God, submission to authority. You are nothing as an individual. And you can see why out of this, you, you, suicide bombings is not a big deal because you as an individual are nothing. And, and it's not even, you know, this, this selfish motivation of virgins in the afterlife. Uh, selfish. But it's not even that. It's, it's that these people are nothings and they know they're nothing. And they have to serve a greater good. And if God has called on them to blow themselves up, then God has called on them to blow themselves up. It's, I, I think it's even wrong to assume that they are doing it for the virgins. They're doing it because they do it. Because that's, they don't exist. They're nobodies. There is no, no such thing as an individual. This is part of this big collective that is Islam, and, and it's all for the glory of God. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time and areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credits over 30 months starting within three bills. If cancel service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time and areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credits over 30 months starting within three bills. If cancel service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. Okay, any questions on kind of their ideas, where they're coming from? Yeah? The notion of Muhammad being the perfect man for all time, forever and ever. Yes. Um. <laughs> Repeat the question. Yeah, uh, the question is uh, about their view that Muhammad is the perfect man uh, forever and ever. And Muhammad is... Muhammad is a man, first of all. He's not a god. He is a man. He is a prophet. He communicates directly with God. Uh, and he is perfect. Um, and, and some of them would say he is so perfect that all his actions, his literal concrete actions, should be emulated. And the way he brought about a Muslim nation needs to be emulated. So the fact, for example, that he left Mecca and went to Medina and then returned to Mecca means to them that they have to be exiled and they have to form their unity in exile and then come back to the origins. And indeed, bin Laden viewed the Taliban in Afghanistan as his Medina. He, would, he still wanted to go back to Saudi Arabia and Mecca, so he viewed that as a necessary kind of transition. Uh, originally thought Sudan was going to be it. That didn't work out, so he shifted to Afghanistan. But they're looking... For, for this first establishment, for the first day, day Medina, where they can bring all the troops together, where they can start their, their you know, Christian word, their crusade to go back and take over Saudi Arabia, which is the heart of, of their religious empire. But all of Muhammad's actions, all of his little sayings are all documented, and they're all, all law, because he was perfection. Everything he did was true and right. You know? And, you know, when they behead people, 
right? When, they, when we see these videos of beheading. Um, Muhammad, after one battle, uh, it, it, it decides that this one Jewish tribe in Medina had, um, had uh, betrayed him and uh, was the reason for this, the, the number of dead that he had in this battle. And he basically went back and beheaded every male and enslaved every woman and child. You know, this is the religion of peace, right? Um, as, and, and, and they take that beheading as some kind of ritualistic, you need to do this with, with people who are betrayers, with people who are infidels. This is an appropriate way to send a message because, of course, the other Jewish tribes very quickly, you know, got in tow. You don't, you don't upset this guy. It worked then, and they're going to try it again today. Yeah. You had a question? Uh, I was just going to ask, do you think that without the oil money? Oh, we'll get to oil money. Okay. haven't gotten to oil money yet. Uh, will you be talking about uh, Saudi Arabia? Yeah, we'll be talking about Saudi Arabia in a little while. Yeah, John. As you described the Muslim Brotherhood, I couldn't help but see parallels between what they were saying ideologically and what Martin Luther yeah. said ideologically. Both reactionaries who thought that the then current leadership that veered away from the principles of 1400 years earlier, we need to get back to, to that. Any thoughts on that comparison? I don't know enough about Martin Luther. And, and, and I'd say part of the differences is that they were rebelling against, Martin Luther was rebelling against a clear, uh, there was much more of a clear enemy in a sense of a Catholic church that was clearly structured, that was at a particular political entity. This is a little bit less, the rebellion against the religious authority is, uh, the religious authority is not quite as uh, structured and rigid and, uh, and politically powerful. They're politically uh, I'd say they're politically weak, and that's one of the criticisms of them, that they are, um, that they are much, uh, that they are basically go along with whatever the regime wants them to do, and that's the criticism. The other difference is, and this is based on my very partial understanding of Martin Luther. Martin Luther very much said, um, you know, what happens in this earth doesn't matter. This earth is scum. It's horrible. You want to charge usury? Charge usury. It doesn't matter. And by doing that, kind of freed people up to do kind of whatever they wanted, which was probably a positive. Muslims, and then he said, the real, what really matters is only heaven, and only some of you are going to make it anyway, and, and it's already predetermined maybe, you know, in some kind of bizarre way. So it kind of freed people up in some sense. The Muslims are the exact opposite. Here they're saying, what happens in this world is what really matters. Everything is the same. You've got to be really, really, really... It's, it's as if everybody was a Protestant and now the Catholics are revolting against the Protestants and trying to establish a rigid... So it's kind of the reverse. Yeah, maybe it's the reverse. I'd never thought of that. Okay, two more. Yeah. Um, I sort of get the impression from what you were saying that um, the particular hatred towards the Jews of the, the Muslim people in the Middle East is more a consequence of the fact that Israel was, in state, was reinstated or instated there. Is, is, it, is there something more historical that the hatred towards the Jews per se, or is it basically that Israel was created? Yeah, so the question is, is the hatred of the Jews, is there something historical that relates to the hatred of the Jews that is primarily motivated by the establishment of Israel there? The Jews, I mean, there's, a, there's quite a bit in the Quran about the Jews. If you, early in the Quran, uh, there's a lot of positive stuff about the Jews. For example, when uh, Muhammad first establishes his religion, and you know, and they have to pray five times a day, and they have to face Mecca. Well, originally they faced Jerusalem. Uh, and then when the, because he thought politically he could get the Jews on board, if they faced Jerusalem, he'd show them that it was consistent with Judaism, and they could all face Jerusalem, and they'd all join his, you know, his religion. When they didn't, he got really upset. And he figured that politically, if they faced Mecca, where they were very wealthy merchants, where he could get, he can now get, and, and if you take my course on the history of the Middle East, I go into this in more detail, why politically he was a real, really, really smart Muhammad and how, and how he played both the financial game and the political game and the religious game really well. And why Mecca and why those shrines in Mecca are so holy has nothing to do with God and everything to do with trade. 
and, and how to get the merchants on board, because when you create those shrines, as these shrines of Islam, and you make it one of the four pillars of Islam that every Muslim in the world has to come there, what does it do to trade in Mecca? <laughs> I mean, you just created a bunch of really wealthy merchants, and they, they were happy, and they, that's how he got them. That's how he got them to join. So, but there is some animosity towards the Jews related to them not joining, related to this tribe that he, he beheads. But ultimately, Jews are like Christians. They're better than the rest of the non-Muslims. Uh, they're second-class citizens in the sense that they have to pay a special tax. But if you look at Islamic history, now there's some, there's some revisionist history being written these days that I, I don't know if it's true or not. I, I have to go back and see. But my understanding of is that at least until the 19th century, uh, Jews were treated much better in the Muslim lands than they were in Europe. Now there's some, again, revisionists where they're saying that's not true, but I, I'm not convinced of that. Much better. Now, again, not a first-class citizens, but much, much better than they were by the Christians in Europe. And indeed, much of the anti-Semitism, much of the, uh, uh, the horrific anti-Semitism that we see today in their world, the stories about Jews drinking blood and sacrificing a Passover and all that stuff, came to them from Europe, uh, was imported with the uh, Christian missionaries who came in in the 19th century and brought that form of anti-Semitism in with them. The establishment of Israel really set all that off. Was a, was a, because it, it, to them it is, um, it is, again, it's a crusade. It's, it's, it's taking over Muslim land and giving it into the hands of an infidel. So that has really coalesced that anti-Semitism, made it much more vehement much, uh, and much more urgent. Whereas the Jews were insignificant up until that point. And today, it's, it's out of, I mean, it's, the Nazis had nothing on these guys today. And the last question was back there. Yeah. Uh, you said that uh, the people who commit suicide think that they are nothing. <clears throat> Isn't it hard to believe that there's actually nothing in it for them to do this? Well, sure. A sense of pride or, you know, a false sense of pride. Their families... Uh, admire this. They get something out of it. Yes, but think about it this way. I mean, what does a nihilist get out of blowing stuff up? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a certain sick sense of satisfaction, and, and they suddenly get that, and, and it's suddenly they think, I mean, put it this way, they think that they are doing the right thing. They think and are convinced that they are moral heroes. Not because they're going to see the virgins, but because they're doing the right thing. They're killing the right people in the name of God. So, the, the, yes, there's that sense. But, but their individual lives, qua individual human beings, are insignificant. That's the only thing that could allow them to do that. Okay. So, yes, they, they certainly are committed and, and, and get that, a sense of false pride and false satisfaction for knowing that they are doing what's right. But, and, and psychologically, maybe that's why they're doing it. But it's not... It's not the, the ideological motivation. They are true religionists. They truly believe in this. Uh, they, they, they're not faking. Okay, we're going to get back to the Muslim Brotherhood in jail and back to, uh, to a little bit of, uh, uh, back to Egyptian history, modern Egyptian history. Um, as I said, the revolution happens in 52. Nasser comes to power. He cleans it up. He gets rid of some of his other officers that... Uh, that, that he doesn't like that much, consolidates control over Egypt, and really becomes a hero in 1956 in the entire Arab world, because in 1956, he basically kicks the French and the English out. He nationalizes the Suez Canal. If you know a little bit about this history, uh, the French and the British actually stand up for themselves. They uh, paratroop troops into the Suez Canal. They do a military blockade. They align themselves with Israel that, in, that takes over the Sinai Peninsula. And it is Eisenhower who uh, pushes them all back home uh, and uh, uh, says that uh, NASA has every right to nationalize it, leave him alone, get out of the way. So it is America that actually stops the Europeans, the Europeans' last stand, stops them from taking that position okay, and forces Israel to retreat from Sinai only to have to retake it 11 years later, this is 56, they retake it in 67, and sends the French and the, and the British home. Um, 
they w could have held the Suez Canal. Those, the, the Egyptians did not have the military force to take them out. Israel easily took over the Sinai Peninsula and stopped just short of the Suez Canal because the French and the, and the English wanted to seem as if they were somewhat remote from the Israelis, even though it was all a coordinated attack. Um, Nasser is then a hero. He has repelled. He has repelled the West. Uh, he becomes a, a, a hero throughout the Arab world, uh, a unifying force under the name of Arabism, under this idea of nationalism. The Arabs will all unite. They will become a, a, a mighty force. He aligns himself strongly with military regimes in Syria and ultimately in Iraq, where nationalist forces are on the rise. There is a treaty between Syria and Egypt that kind of creates a pseudo one nation. It gets broken several times, it gets re-signed and broken because they can't really get along. But, but there's this illusion and there's this real energy within the Arab world that this is it. And again, if you read Western scholars of the time, they're convinced that this is the future of the Middle East. It's this nationalism. This Nasser is a wonderful person. Of course, he's an incredibly uh, brutal authoritarian. Um, he is a complete socialist. Um, one of the reasons Eisenhower does this, one of the reasons Eisenhower pulls the French and the English out is uh, communism. He thinks that by doing this, Nasser will become a friend of America. He thinks that by doing this, he will show, you know, I don't know, that, that he is against colonialism too, and that the Arab world will rally to the West. Indeed, what happens to Nasser immediately after 1956 is he cuts off his relationship with the U.S. and Europe and establishes strong, strong ties with the Soviet Union. The big dam that's built on the Nile River, which was a symbolic project. Uh, the contract is given to the Soviets. Uh, the Americans are completely shut out of the building of the Answa Dam. Oh, so much hair for a newborn. We need to start planning his baptism and his holiday outfit and, ooh, his birthday party. Sure, but um, how long are you planning to stay? If you're one of those who goes to meet your newborn nephew and stays until his first birthday party, switch to Cricket Wireless. Use your phone as many days as you want in Mexico without extra cost. Smile. You're on Cricket. Requires eligible plan. Minimum $55 per month. Data speed usage and other restrictions apply. Coverage not available everywhere. See store for details. Oh, so much hair for a newborn. We need to start planning his baptism and his holiday outfit and, ooh, his birthday party. Sure, but um, how long are you planning to stay? If you're one of those who goes to meet your newborn nephew and stays until his first birthday party, switch to Cricket Wireless. Use your phone as many days as you want in Mexico without extra cost. Smile. You're on Cricket. Requires eligible plan. Minimum $55 per month. Data speed usage and other restrictions supply. Coverage not available everywhere. See store for details. So this is really the, the 1950s, late 50s, uh, 1960s are the height of Arab nationalism. Nationalists take over in Algeria, in Tunisia, in Syria, Yemen, Iraq, and Libya. You know, uh, Muammar Gaddafi comes, comes about as a, as a nationalist, as an Arab unifier, not as an Islamic leader. I mean, he's, he's a pretty good chameleon in the way he has changed over the years. The Syrian, the new military leader in Syria in 19... 49, again under the Nationalist banner, declares, give me five years and I will make Syria as prop, prosperous and enlightened as Switzerland. You know, they're convinced that, you know, they have it all. That they are going to, and, and they bought into these Western ideas about nationalism and about socialism. Um, colonialism pretty much comes to an end uh, with the Suez Canal. There's still one last battle to be fought, and that's in Algeria, the Algeria War of Independence against the French. Uh, but that's all resolved by the, uh, I think, by the early, by the 60s. Uh, the French are out, and really the era of colonialism is, is finished. Socialism sweeps the entire, uh, all these nationalist countries. Iraq clearly becomes socialist. Syria becomes socialist. Egypt, uh, everything is nationalized. Uh, all, m much of the private enterprise that existed in Egypt is, is nationalized. Um, uh, a a uh, noted French sociologist writes in 1964, quote, almost every, everyone professes adherence to socialism in the Middle East. 
liberalism is deeply rooted in the urban life of the Arab East. Okay. Now, um, what I think these sociologists don't see is that they're interacting with a small minority of intellectuals in Cairo, in Damascus, in, uh, in Beirut, uh, in, in these major cities. Uh, but fundamentally, and this is why the Muslim Brotherhood could have been successful, fundamentally, the Arab world is Muslim. The, 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 the common person in the Arab world is religious, very religious. What's common to all these countries, and you can include Saudi Arabia, and you can include all the way to Pakistan uh, and, and Afghanistan, is that the, the majority of the people, the overwhelming majority of the people, are Muslim. And even the nationalists, when they come to party, they have these, originally they have these ideas that we don't need religion, kick a religion out very quickly. They, they uh, come to adopt a, an Islamic face. They, uh, for example, Nasser, very quickly, uh, what he does is he restructures Al-Azhar to support him and to come out with fatwa saying what a great leader he is. He needs Islam in order to control the people, in order to get legitimacy from the people. So this world is a fundamentally Muslim world, and that's what the Muslim Brotherhood capitalizes on. Their appeal is not to a secular country that's been converted into Islam or into this radical force in Islam. These are, you know, what we would call everyday Muslims who are not very intellectual, not very philosophical, don't really think about it, but they pray five times a day and they go to the mosque and they hear the preachers. And Islam has an enormous influence on their lives. And I would argue Egypt is the most westernized of all Middle East countries. And it is not very westernized. It is only in the Cairo intelligentsia that you see real influences of the West. The dominant majority of people are still Muslims. Um, so, uh, as I said, Nasser is a brutal dictator. Of course, the economy flounders. Um, and uh, we'll see that by the end of the 1960s, nationalism in the Arab world is dead. In the meantime, in prison, the Muslim Brotherhood are organizing into small cells, study groups, They're sitting around, writing and studying. Um, and while you know, there are executions, uh, there's a massacre of uh, uh, 21 of them lying in their cells at some point by Nasser. He's trying to kill them, even in prison, to try to, try to suppress their influence. They are still intellectually active. Now, one of the phenomena that happens in 1954, and we'll return to this in a little while, is that some of them go to jail, right? Thousands of them go to jail. But many of the Muslim Brotherhood escape. They escape Egypt. They go, many of them, to Saudi Arabia. Others go to Kuwait, Bahrain, Jordan, Syria. But many, many of them go to Saudi Arabia, and we'll, we'll see the link back to Saudi Arabia in a minute. And indeed, Saudi Arabia doesn't like nationalism, and they don't like Nasser. You know, it's a kingdom. Nationalism is very against monarchy. They don't believe in monarchies. They have a different version of dictators, right? Um, and at least, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia is a Muslim monarchy. They've declared themselves. They, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the Wahhabis in a little bit. So they're committed to Islam and they're committed to monarchy. And they start funding the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. So money starts flowing from Saudi Arabia to small groups outside of prison that are being formed to study, not politically active, but just to study, to talk, to start reorganizing from the ruins of 1954. And indeed, what happens is that you start getting Said Qud's writings being smuggled out of jail into apartments, into uh, small group meetings where people are sitting and reading them as they are being written. They are then being photocopied, sent to other groups, and you've got this whole underground network funded to a large extent by the Saudis 
And, and primarily, you know, these Muslim brothers go to Saudi Arabia, they find jobs, there's, there's money in Saudi Arabia, there are indeed jobs there in the oil industry and other industries, and they're sending money back, uh, and they're also getting the Saudi regime itself to be supportive. So between 1956 and 1964, these small groups are reading these books written by Qud. The most important of these is a book called, you could translate it as Signpost on Milestones. You know, I've seen different, different translations of it. This is Said Qud's last book and becomes the manifesto, the manifesto of the reconstituted Muslim Brotherhood and indeed the manifesto of nearly every Islamic totalitarian group that follows. Inspired by signposts, young activists start agitating for violence against the regime and for the overthrow of Nasser. Indeed, this will become the most important, influential, substantial book uh, in the Middle East. It was officially published in 65. I think I told you the story last time. Nasser, it was banned. Nasser read it and then released the ban, and then a year later banned it again. Um, so it was being distributed in 1964, uh, being reprinted and spreading throughout the Muslim world. In 1964, Qud was released as a, uh, as a kind of... Uh, um, Nasser, again, was trying to appease his Muslim population, release some of the Muslim brothers. Um, but as a call, as the Muslim brothers became more agitated, more confident, uh, more violent, by 1965, everybody was rearrested and back in jail. Indeed, both Qutb and his brother, uh, along with hundreds of others, were arrested. And in August 29, 1966, Saeed Qub was hanged uh, nine days after his trial. They had a sentence and they quickly hanged him. They did not want him hanging around. Hanging around, that was not, I didn't mean that. They want to get rid of him. Um, he was hanged very quickly. Uh, and of course, he became a legend at that point. He became the martyr for the cause. He became the giant of, of four Islamic totalitarians everywhere. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time and areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credits over 30 months starting within three bills. If canceled service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time and areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credits over 30 months starting within three bills. If canceled service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. Well, the mainstream condemned him, wrote him off as a, as a heretic. Uh, he was adopted by a significant portion of the population, particularly the, the, the radicalized Muslim Brotherhood and, and many other groups. Okay. Now, who was this guy? Who was Said Qutb? He was born in 1906 um, to, a, uh, again, a well-educated uh, family. He, uh, he had a re relatively secular education. In spite of that fact, he, by the age of 10, had memorized the entire Quran. Uh, but he did that out of his own initiative. His family was relatively secular, anti-British, a nationalist, Egyptian Arab nationalist. He was very widely read, uh, particularly of Western press um, and, uh, and Western literature. He landed up being employed by the Ministry of Public Instruction, which was responsible for all education. And he was responsible for some of the westernization of the Egyptian public schools. He was in charge of reforming the schools. He was an active supporter of liberal, democratic, nationalist ideas. And he wrote, 
He was a, he was a prolific writer. But he wrote literary criticism. His subject was literature. That's what he'd studied. Again, he was very widely read in Western literature. Now, he became quite active in 1945, politically active, uh, for nationalism. And as a consequence, the existing regime, it was still a monarchy, Egypt was still a monarchy, decided to ship him out. Decided that he was too agitating for too much trouble. And indeed, in 1948, he was shipped out for a sabbatical, a three-year sabbatical, to the United States, where he was supposed to come here and study the educational system in the U.S. Now, according to everything that I've written, that I've read, Saeed Good uh, went through some kind of religious experience on the boat trip from Egypt to the U.S. He rededicated himself to Islam, started praying five times a day, uh, and became a committed Muslim on this trip. Now, for that reason, I think, among others, his stay in America was quite traumatic. Um, he found this country to be bizarre, decadent, just horrific. Uh, now, think about this. This is 48 to 51. Uh, the biggest thing he found outrageous was the sexual promiscuity of Americans. <laughs> we think back of the 50s as uh, kind of conservative, right? To him, he found it uh, disgusting, the kind of stuff, the, the, the relationships between men and women. Uh, now, you know, if you want to get into psychology, as some of these books do, he had a bunch of bad relationships before this, uh, you know, who knows. But, um, for example... Uh, he witnessed, uh, he went to some churches to witness services, and he found it mind-numbing that they were singing, that there was music, and that there was dancing, and men and women were mingling freely at these churches. Now, remember, this is an, a westernized Egyptian. This is somebody who was reading Western lit, who, who, were, who was in the circles in Cairo of the more Western um, Egyptians. He returned to Egypt after staying in the United States for three years. And he returned to Egypt as a hater of America, a hater of the West, and a hater of capitalism. He later wrote that he was born in 1951 on his return to Egypt. Everything before that was meaningless. He joined the Muslim Brotherhood in 51, and in 52 was already elected to the Leadership Council. He was, during the, um, the revolution, a prime contact, since he knew them from his previous days as a nationalist, a prime contact with the, with the uh, officers, with the, uh, the revolution. But once it was clear that uh, the Muslim brothers were being used, that they were not going to have any real political power, he quit the nationalist cause completely and devoted himself totally to the Muslim brotherhoods. In his first political book, was titled The Struggle Between Islam and Capitalism. That was the title of the book in 1952, in which he writes, This capitalism, predicated as it is on monopoly and interest-taking, money-grubbing and exploitation, this individualism, which lacks any sense of solidarity and social responsibility other than that laid down by law, that crass and vic uh, vicacious materialistic perception of life, that animal freedom called permissiveness. That to him was capitalism. As I said in 54, he was arrested, sentenced to 25 years of hard labor. He was tortured in jail by the Nasser regime, um, and started writing. Uh, first book was the, his commentaries on the Quran in 30 volumes. And in 1962, he began drafting the first chapters of Signpost. So what are his key concepts? What's Kurt's contribution here? Well, first, to somebody who knew the West, or at least presented itself as somebody who knew the West. He was a huge critic 
of Western, what he viewed, Western materialism. Of the idea that the West followed the rules of man rather than the rules of God. That the rules of man, therefore, were necessarily arbitrary. They lacked the objectivity of mystical revelation. It was supposed to be funny. Um, in the intro to Signpost, he writes, quote, Humanity today stands on the brink of the abyss. Not because of the threat of destruction that hangs over its head. This is the nuclear war between the Soviet Union and the U.S., which everybody was talking about in the 50s, right? For this is merely a symptom of the evil, not the evil itself. But because of its bankruptcy in the domain of values under which man could have lived and developed harmoniously. So if man had the right values, we would all live harmoniously in this paradise, but we don't have those values, and that's the cause of all the problems. He writes, he, quote, humanity needs a new direction. Or in the final analysis, both individualist and collectivist ideologies have failed. It is the turn of Islam. In other words, capitalism has failed, communism has failed, the only alternative is Islam. Islam is the solution to all the world's problems. And the need is for an Islamic nation. The problem with Islam, the reason the Muslim Brotherhood could not rally millions and millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of Muslims around the world, is there was no model for an Islamic state. What we need is an Islamic state. What we need is a state ruled by Sharia. One. And once that Islamic state is there, it'll serve as inspiration. All the Muslim people will rally towards it, and the world is ours, is his logic. And the key for him here is this, or, the, or the, 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 his contribution, the, the, the thing that he, uh, that he adds to what the Muslim brothers already have, is this uh, idea that if there is no rule of Islamic law, if there is no country truly ruled by Islamic law, then there is no Islam. There are no Muslims. Everybody, in a sense, now is a pagan. Uh, he calls this, uh, in Arabic, he calls it Jahiliya. And Jahiliya is the stage that people had that the world existed as before the appearance of Muhammad. Yes, J-A-H-I-L-I-Y-Y-A. And by the way, all these spellings are from one book, but other books spell it differently. Uh, same with a lot of the names. So this is the barbaric stage of pre-Muhammad, pre-Islam. And as long as there's no Islamic law somewhere, Everybody is in a state of barbarism. And the political leaders of the country cannot therefore be viewed as Muslims at all. They're not Muslims. And from this day on, for example, among the Islamic totalitarian circles, the rule of Egypt is called Pharaoh. Because that's what the rule of Egypt was pre-Islam, right? He was the Pharaoh. And when they kill Sadat, when they murder Sadat in 1981, they talk about murdering the Pharaoh. We didn't kill a Muslim. He was not a Muslim. Because he is not living under Islamic law. He's not, as a ruler, he's not imposing Islamic law. Therefore, he doesn't count. Said could legitimize this by the use of this term. The concept of revolution, of overthrow of the, of the existing rulers, he legitimizes but with this concept the killing of Muslims. Uh, he legitimizes any action necessary in order to establish an Islamic state. Now, he in his writings never talks about violence because he knows the consequences. He knows he'll be killed immediately. So this is all kind of in code. But by using this term, this barbaric stage, he basically defines everybody as an apostate. Everyone is an apostate. Everybody who doesn't advocate right now for Islamic law is an apostate. And apostate is the worst thing in Islam. It's, it's better to be a Christian or a Jew. 
Apostates are Muslims that have turned their back on Islam. That is the lowest of all. They've had the truth, they've known it, and they've consciously rejected it. That's why in Afghanistan, this guy who converted from Islam to Christianity was worse than Christians. That's why they wanted to kill him. Because that, was, that is the ultimate sin, is to turn your back on Islam. And if all the world is apostate, if all the Muslim world, is what we view as the Muslim world, is apostate, all violence is permitted against them. Could calls for a vanguard. Says the way to bring about a truly Islamic state is what we need is a vanguard. A small group of dedicated intellectuals and soldiers who will create their own, who will live under Islamic law even if it's not the, the political state of the world and who will work to spread, to establish Islam as the rule over all Islamic lands. He says this vanguard is going to be small. Again, even the word vanguard, even th that terminology, this guy's read Lenin. He's read, he's read Western. You know, this, the communism had this notion of a vanguard that goes out and, and, and spreads the word and, and establishes a foothold and, and gets everything going. What we need is a vanguard to find a state and establish a state. He said the best state to do this in is Egypt. He says Egypt has always been at the heart of Islam. It's the most intellectual. It's the most powerful. It has the most people. It is, of all the Arab countries, it is the most populated. But it could be anyway. We need to start somewhere. And, and notice, by the way, that nobody then or now in the Islamic totalitarian movement considers Saudi Arabia to be an Islamic state. There are compromises, there are pieces, and, and we'll, we'll get to that. So to him, that's not a model. The model is this new state that needs to come about. Okay. So the vanguard needs, and this vanguard, in order to know what to do, in order to know how to establish, it needs signposts. It needs a path. And this book that I'm writing, Quid says, is going to illustrate, going to give you the milestones, the signposts on how to do this and how to go about bringing about this wonderful state. And again, that's why it becomes this manifesto. Okay. Indeed, Muhammad and his small group who leave Mecca and go to Medina and establish Islam are a vanguard. And he says, you know, that's what we need to emulate. We need to emulate what Muhammad did and how he acted. Remember, the only sovereignty is God. Everything you do in the name of God is legitimate. The restoration of Islam requires a revolution. And the vanguard must focus first on understanding and contemplating the Quran themselves, uh, becoming complete Muslims, and denying the entire Greek and Persian and philosophical and Western Ideas. They have to deny all of that. They reject all of it and return to the very foundations. And what you need is change in deed, not in word at all. Not in words only. Now, could calls for a jihad. And he criticizes those in Islam that claim that jihad is just a personal... Yeah, I mean, you've probably all heard of this because the moderate Muslims come out and say this. Jihad really means just the personal struggle that we all have between the temptations of the flesh and the teachings of the Quran. And it could say that's ridiculous. And he also rejects the notion that jihad is defensive only. That is only to protect Islam. No, he says. Jihad is also offensive. It is our responsibility to bring Islam and the truth to the world. Jihad also, he says, without specifying the details, cannot be waged through words alone. Cannot be waged through words alone. So we need a vanguard, and it better be prepared for violence. Now notice that could, in a sense, excommunicates all Muslims and all Muslim regimes that are not living under Sharia. And in a sense, converts the Muslim Brotherhood 
from a, a movement that's mainly pious civilians with a political agenda, trying to move within political services, uh, political system, establishing welfare and schools and mosques, to a movement with self-conscious conscript soldiers ready for battle, ready for a revolution. So much hair for a newborn. We need to start planning his baptism and his holiday outfit and, ooh, his birthday party. Sure, but um, how long are you planning to stay? If you're one of those who goes to meet your newborn nephew and stays until his first birthday party, switch to Cricket Wireless. Use your phone as many days as you want in Mexico without extra cost. Smile, you're on Cricket. Requires eligible plan. Minimum $55 per month. Data speed usage and other restrictions apply. Coverage not available everywhere. See store for details. Oh, so much hair for a newborn. We need to start planning his baptism and his holiday outfit and, ooh, his birthday party. Sure, but um, how long are you planning to stay? If you're one of those who goes to meet your newborn nephew and stays until his first birthday party, switch to Cricket Wireless. Use your phone as many days as you want in Mexico without extra cost. Smile, you're on Cricket. Requires eligible plan. Minimum $55 per month. Data speed usage and other restrictions supply. Coverage not available everywhere. See store for details. Now, could relies on at least two thinkers in establishing uh, these ideas. A contemporary of his, uh, name is uh, Said Abdul Allah Maududi, M A W D U D I. Uh, Indian Muslim, uh, born in India, uh, forced to leave India and go to Pakistan when India and Pakistan are uh, uh, separated. And uh, to a large extent, Maududi uh, is very similar to Kurd, and his influence is very similar to Kurd's influence in Pakistan. And, and one of the reasons Pakistan is so radical, and, and why it's such a breeding ground for, for this form of radical Islam today, is Maududi's activism and, and uh, teachings. And he had a kind of a, a real relationship. Kurt was reading him, and he was reading Kurt. I mean, they were influencing each other constantly. And uh, a lot of the network established in Pakistan was established by him. He built schools. He built social networks. He established the foundations for what we see today in Pakistan, for the, for the radical uh, Islamic nature of much of that country, uh, was, uh, was the, this Maududi's uh, doing. Uh, Kurt is a at least according to the sources I read, is a much better writer than Maduri, is a much better popularizer of these ideas, and is a much more powerful voice, and that's why he is really at the heart of this, and, and he's read in Pakistan, Maduri is a, is a much more obscure figure out there, but is responsible for the state of Pakistan today to a large extent. The second source of all these people, really, is a, uh, is a um, Muslim thinker from the Middle Ages, by the name of Ibn Taymiyyah. And I'm just going to say a few words about Ibn Taymiyyah. I talk about him more in my History of the Middle East class. But uh, Ibn Taymiyyah lived in Egypt during the period of the Mongol invasions. Uh, the Mongols had taken over uh, uh, Iraq and Syria. And there was a constant struggle between Muslims in Egypt and the Mongols. Now, at some point, the Mongols all converted to Islam. But they imposed Mongol laws while ruling as so-called Muslims. And Ibn Taymiyyah came up with this concept that they are apostates. That in spite of being Muslims, because they weren't imposing Sharia, they were apostates. And Ibn Taymiyyah was, was popularized by Rashid Rida, who, 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 uh, which we talked about yesterday, and who Bana read, and then he, he directly influenced this idea of the barbaric state pre-Islam and this apostasy of all Muslims who didn't live under Sharia was definitely a strong influence on Said Qurb. And when you read uh, Bin Laden, if you read, I mean, I don't know if you do, but if you ever read the, his long statements and stuff, uh, he quotes Ibn Taymiyyah extensively. So this is the kind of the intellectual source of a lot of this, um, but really gets, becomes a powerful voice through Said Qurb. Uh, many commentators comment on the fact that Kud's book for totalitarian Islam was what Lenin's What is to be done now was for communism. It was the manual. 
It was signposts. It was the call for action. Now, with Clip's death in 1966 and Nasser's strongly anchored in power and oppressing the Muslim Brotherhood, again, people thought this was dead. People thought it was finished. People, whatever, whatever hopes people might have had in, the, in Egypt in the late 50s and early 60s for the resurrection of the Brotherhood was done. Kurt was killed. The Brotherhood was in jail again. And what's interesting is another huge migration happened. Muslim brothers leave Egypt again. Again, they're being oppressed, and they leave. And they go again to primarily Saudi Arabia. And here we arrive at the, really at the end of the nationalist as an ideal era in the Arab world. And that happens in June of 1967. Nasser, the all-powerful Arab nationalist, rallies the Syrians, and to some extent the Jordanians, to war with Israel. He invades the Sinai, masses his troops on the border with Israel. The Sinai, uh, after the 56 war, was declared a, non, uh, a non-militarized zone. There were no Egyptian troops there. There was UN troops stationed. Nasser basically tells the UN to get out. The UN says, okay, and they run away. Nasser comes in. He closes off the straits that don't allow shipping into Israel's southern port of Elat. Um, The Syrians amass on uh, on the Golan Heights, start shooting down into the valleys below. The Jordanians, in spite of being asked by the Israelis not to intervene and not again to to this, uh, participate in the war. Israel demolishes all three armies, including uh, the, the additional troops from Iraq and Lebanon and other countries that join in, demolishes them in six days. And six days is an overstatement because they actually do away with the Sinai in like three and a half days, and then they're busy cleaning up stuff in the Golan Heights. And the Golan Heights means climbing like this to go fight at the top of them. If you've been to the Golan Heights, it's this plain, and it just drops into the valleys, into this big valley in Israel, and they have to climb up, demolish the Syrians. Um, The Jordanians participate, lose the entire West Bank. And this is just, this is just horrific in the Arab world. I mean, their hopes, their dreams are shattered. They thought nationalism was the solution, that Nasser would bring about victory. In 1948, when Israel established, gets established, uh, it's, it's just a shock to them that Israel could win in 1948. But then in 67, after the rise of Nasser and the promises and, and, and all these armies aligned against the Israelis to lose, basically destroyed the ideal of nationalism in the Middle East. And what you have from then on, you still have nationalistic governments like the Ba'ath Party in Syria and the Ba'ath Party in Iraq, but at that point, the idealism is gone. The, the, the utopian notion of Arab unity is gone. From that point, these are just brutal dictators oppressing their people. Even the people see it that way. Uh, whereas beforehand, yeah, there were brutal dictators oppressing their people, but the people viewed it as, this is good for us. This is for the greater good of the Arab. You know, that is demolished in 1967. And indeed, it creates this in- huge intellectual uh, ideological vacuum. Because if nationalism didn't work, we tried that now. Another, you know, we tried this Western ideal. This was brought to us by the West, right? Socialism, nationalism, those are not Muslim or Arab concepts. These are concepts we borrowed from Europe. And that has crashed and failed. What now? What do we do now? The West has failed us. The Ottomans failed us. Everything seems to fail us. So that becomes a really key and an opportunity, as we'll see, for the Muslim Brotherhood. Okay. Huge disillusion, disillusionment. Um, you've got a very literate generation. One of the things the nationalists did do is they, they, they expanded education dramatically. So you've got a lot of people who are well-read, who know what's going on, um, and, and just, you know, have no clue where to turn to. Indeed, what's interesting is, in the 1960s, you have the first generation of Muslims 
the first time that Muslims can overwhelmingly read the Quran for themselves. Previously, most of them were illiterate and had to understand all the understanding of the Quran came from the scholars, came from the religious leaders. And one of the things that happens, and notice that Bana is not a religious leader, Kut, is not a, Kut was secular until he started writing interpretations of the Quran. And one of the things that becomes popular is personal interpretation of the Quran. Everybody, since we can all read it, we can all now interpret it. We'll see that that, that is not something that, for example, Ayatollah Khomeini likes and will we'll, we'll challenge. There's also a demographic explosion in the Arab world. Um, you know, healthcare is better than it was in the 19th century. Uh, money has flowed in through the, uh, the oil wealth that is all over the Arab world. And yet unemployment is huge. And Arabs are looking around and say, what have we gained since we kicked out the colonialists? And we don't have the colonialists to blame anymore. We did this. We lost the war. It wasn't the, and the French and the, and, and the British didn't even come to Israel's aid. And up until 1967, Israel received no military or financial help from the U.S. Nothing. Zero. Zilch. They, they had airplanes from France and tanks from Britain. No help from the U.S. They couldn't blame their defeat on the West. It was Israel. These Jews beat them. And that was just bizarre. Yeah. Wasn't there air power support from the U.S.? Or if I get the wrong wars mixed up. Didn't they threaten to drop the bomb unless the U.S. backed them up with the promised no. uh, plane? No. They, 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 you're mixing wars a little bit, and even that's not completely true, even of the war that you mean it for. Uh, that was 73, and even there, that's not completely true. But there, but there is some, you know, they, in 1973, there was a massive airlift of weaponry into Israel from the United States. And there was an issue of the bomb, but that had more to do with the fact that Israel was getting very close to Cairo and very close to Damascus. And as a consequence, the Soviet Union said, if Israel gets any closer, we're sending troops. And there was a nuclear alert because this could have turned into the stage for, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a nuclear confrontation between the U.S. And that's, that's where the bomb was talked about. And Israel in 1973, I believe, there's no evidence, uh, there's no proof of this. But I believe that in 1973, Israel had its nuclear capacity up in the air. That is, they, were, they had nuclear bombs up in airplanes because they thought they might lose. They came this close to losing and they were not going to go down without using their nuclear capacity. So for the first time, maybe since uh, Hiroshima, well, the U.S. has nuclear capacity up in the air uh, regularly, but here it was ready to be used in 73. But uh, it wasn't as a threat to, for the U.S. to come and help them. It was just as an existential necessity because uh, they came very close to losing that war. It, you know, in the first two or three days after that, it was, uh, it was over for the Arabs. Uh, there was another question. Yeah. Maybe something you don't want to get into, but how could um, such a force that size be destroyed in six days with a massive underestimate of Jewish power? What happened? Well, uh, uh, motivation to fight. I mean, these, these kids from, from, from the Nile are stationed in Sinai and told to kill these people for what? Why? You know. Well, but, but Nasser wasn't using Allah to do it, so they weren't inspired by religion. And nationalism, well, you know, there was a lot of this now. You know, how much fervor? You know, it's my life. What am I dying exactly for? I think so that's part of it. The Jews, on the other hand, the Israelis were motivated by survival. They were fighting for their farms, for their homes, for their children. The Egyptians hadn't seen their family in weeks or months. They were a thousand miles away, hundreds of miles away. Israel wasn't going to invade Egypt. They were going to take the Sinai, which was just desert. Um, it wasn't personal. For the Israelis, it was personal. It was their lives. Um, you know, Israel's a free country. Generally, in war, free countries beat out the unfree countries. You know, it might take longer than six days, typically. Um, you know, i tell you just one story about the Six-Day War, and then we'll move on. Um, the Egyptians turned and ran. And they, were, and they wanted to run so fast that uh, their boots was slowing them down. So they took their boots off and ran barefoot. And when you see aerial photographs of the Sinai, you know, close up uh, from planes, what you see is trails of boots. They were literally running, taking off their boots and continuing to run. Um, in, um, 
my dad, uh, we, we, I was living in London at the time. My dad flew back to Israel to, 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 to be in the war. And he got, when he, when he landed, he got Egyptian boots to wear because the Israelis were collecting them and using them. Um, Israel had brilliant tactics. They were smart. They, they, they knew what they were doing. They did a blitzkrieg, basically, on the Sinai. They didn't stop to clean and mop things up. They just went and, and took the whole thing. And I think and, and the second thing was air power. Uh, Israel surprised them. So Israel actually started the war in the sense of the first shot. Um, Israel uh, preempted them, destroyed the entire air force of the Egyptians on the ground. They never took off. So Israel had complete air superiority throughout the war. So there are many tact, you know, strategic and tactical reasons why it happened, but motivation has a big factor. And just, yeah. It was a fascinating exchange between uh, the king of uh, Jordan and Egypt, where they were both communicating with each other about neither one of them wanted to lose face, and they both were declaring, you know, we destroyed you know, 85% of the Zionist oh. airplanes, and it kind of went back and forth, and they're both saying, you know, our guys are doing great, so you keep going, and they were both in retreat. It was just an interesting uh, No, I think that's right, and even in the papers during the Six-Day War, they were reporting victory until the end, and then they had to somehow explain why they were completely defeated, because the soldiers were coming back from the front, and it was obvious. Um, indeed, Nasser never recovered from that, uh, from that loss um, and uh, died uh, in 1970, uh, you know, a broken man and, and, and nowhere near as political powerful, uh, politically powerful as he was in 1967. This is considered a huge mistake of his, but of course, <laughs> you know, what do you expect from a, from a, a, a dictator like that? And you, you could also argue that he was finished anyway because the economy of Egypt was crumbling just crumbling from all his nationalization of socialism. And some would say that this was a diversion. He was hoping that victory in, in Israel would help divert the Egyptians' attention away from that. With Nasser's death, uh, Sadat comes to power, Anwar Sadat. Sadat launches a war against Israel in 1973, which, is, which he loses, but is spinned as a success. Partially, by the way, because the United States intervened to prevent Israel from crushing the Egyptian forces, stopped that and negotiated uh, uh, an end to the war. I mean, the, the, one of the biggest foreign policy mistakes the U.S. made. But Sadat managed to spin it because they, his forces managed to cross the Suez Canal and actually establish footholds on the other side of the Suez Canal. And any little victory over Israel was considered, wow. Um, Sadat also cuts ties with the Soviet Union and befriends the United States. He begins economic liberalization in 1975. And indeed, in an historical act, goes to Jerusalem in 1977 and speaks in front of the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, and signs a peace deal with Israel in 1979, by which Israel gives back the entire Sinai Peninsula, except for Gaza. He didn't want it. I mean, he didn't. Israel would have loved to give back the Gaza Strip, but the Egyptians did not want Gaza. Uh, he also, starting in 71, releases jailed Muslim brothers, uh, claims to be their friend, uh, tries to Islamize the state kind of slowly, even to the extent in 1977 of promising the Muslim brothers that he will impose Sharia. Never does, but he kind of makes that promise. Now, once the Muslims uh, uh, brothers are out of prison, they start getting active again. Um, uh, one of the phenomena that happens in the 70s is they split into multiple groups. The more militant groups, inspired directly with, by Kurt, uh, go underground. Uh, many of the more mainstream Muslim brothers reject aspects of Kut, primarily those leading to violence, but are still committed to the ultimate goal. Um, both types of Muslim brothers place a renewed emphasis on the universities. And indeed, indeed an Islamist uh, student union is established, student group is established called the Jamaat Ismaiya, which by the mid-1970s, controls the student union 
at every major Egyptian university. They become the dominant force on Egyptian campuses, preaching this radical form of Islam. More and more women, what's that? Jamaat, J-A-M-A-A-T, J-A-M-A-A-T, Islamia, I-S-L-A-M-I-Y-Y-A. They become such a dominant force on campuses that Sadat starts rethinking his openness to the Muslim Brotherhood. You remember I said they release them, they imprison them, they release them, they imprison them. They need them because it's a way to appease the masses of, of Muslims because the country is fundamentally Islamic. But they can't tolerate them because they're a threat to the regime. Um, while mainstream Muslim Brotherhood tries to moderate, tries to reject Kurt's more radical views, it can't really escape the logic of its own cause. Uh, other splinter groups uh, start worrying Sadat even more because they are advocating for violence. And indeed, particularly after the, the war, um, after the, um, uh, the, he goes to Jerusalem, uh, the Muslim Brotherhoods just reject him completely. I mean, this is just an act of massive betrayal to sign a peace treaty with the enemies, with the crusaders in Jerusalem. This is just terrific. And then, of course, he also betrays them by not imposing Sharia as he promises them in 1977. So Sadat is building himself up to be a major enemy of the Muslim brothers. A major, uh, you know, he is considered Pharaoh, considered an apostate. Now, uh, we will rejoin the Muslim brothers tomorrow, talk uh, a little bit, bit more about them in, um, in Egypt. I'll give you a sense of what moderate Muslim brotherhoods means. Uh, through their attitude to some, to some, uh, some issues. Uh, and then we're going to turn for a little while uh, to the beachhead the Muslim Brotherhoods have now established starting in the 1950s in Saudi Arabia and the resulting mixture of Muslim Brotherhood and Wahhabis and what that results with, the, the combination of the Wahhabis and the Muslim Brothers. Uh, and then I really hope that tomorrow we'll, uh, we will also have time to cover the uh, Iranian revolution because I'm running out of time very quickly here. Yeah, uh, quickly because we've got like you, one minute. You mentioned fatwa. Yeah. Can you explain who issues them and then the impact or the obligation of... A fatwa is a religious ruling. It can be issued by any religious leader, anybody who's educated in interpreting the, the Quran. And indeed... Uh, the, in the modern view uh, of these Islamists, anybody can issue a fatwa who is considered by the community a leader, uh, 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 a well-educated in Islam, and it commits the community to it. Now, you've got contradictory fatwas going on all the time, and indeed different people are going to follow different fatwas. But, but the thing about Islam, particularly the Sunni form of Islam, is there is no religious hierarchy. There is no pope. And therefore, any religious leader can issue any fatwa. And again, they view, since all Muslims are supposed to be one and have one consciousness and understand the Quran and everything in the same way, they should all know which fatwas to follow and, and which ones are corrupt. But that's why you get Bin Laden issuing fatwas, because he's a leader and, and recognized as an Islamic, knows the Islam uh, by his followers, and then you get a fatwa out of Saudi Arabia that contradicts it, or a fatwa out of Egypt that contradicts those two. And uh, it, it, literally, Zakawi can issue fatwas, and then you know the, the, the El Azhar can issue fatwas. So uh, fatwas can be issued by pretty much anyone. And uh, you, you know, today you get to choose which ones you want to follow and which ones you don't. There's no way to enforce the use of fatwas other than if you belong, if you if you upset Al Qaeda, they'll kill you. You know, so so you want to. You know, so within their circles, you have to follow those fatwas because there is an enforce and mechanism to force, and this is it. But yeah, well, quickly. Was communism viewed differently uh, in the fifties in the Middle East than it was. I mean, that was kind of the heyday here. And, uh, yeah, communism was viewed positively by the nationalists in the fifties and sixties. By the Islamists, it was never viewed well, positively. Said capitalism has failed, communism has failed. That seems pretty astute in the fifties to identify. Yeah, he was already failed. saying that in the fifties. He said communism is a failure. Look, look at how it's become so oppressive and so. 
Oh, he's pointing to the Soviet Union. I, I mean, people knew what was going on. It wasn't a secret. It just took the West, Western intellectuals a while to recognize what they were already seeing with their eyes. It wasn't a mystery in the 50s what Stalin was doing, particularly in the late 50s, early 60s. Thank you. I'll see you all tomorrow morning. This course continues with Lecture 3. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long-distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time and areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credits over 30 months, starting within three bills. If canceled service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long-distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time and areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credits over 30 months, starting within three bills. If canceled service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. To 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 your local AT&T store for details.